Sweet Summer Days is happening now at Whole Foods Market with sales on the juiciest fruits of the season, organic peaches, organic cantaloupes, blueberries, and strawberries. That's an epic fruit salad. You'll also find sweet sales on fresh Alaska sockeye salmon and halibut and grill-ready fruity marinades. Keep your wallet happy with aisles of savings from 365 by Whole Foods Market, like sparkling waters, frozen fruits, and snacks. Sweeten your summer at Whole Foods Market. Terms apply. Hi there, everybody. Ira Glass here. Today's program is a rerun, but from a long time ago. So, for example, it's back when the person who is at the center of the story still smoked. And it's so long ago that the city where the episode takes place, Paris, still allowed smoking indoors. Anyway, it's a great show. We haven't aired it in years. Total favorite. In honor of Bastille Day this month, here we go. It's a gray, rainy day in Paris. A sulky line of tourists waits on the grounds of an old medieval palace, now one of the most famous museums in the world. I'm with David Sedaris, who lives nearby. So David, so, so explain where we are. We're at the Louvre, and this is the closest I've ever come. I've never set foot, never set foot inside the Louvre. So you've lived in Paris for how long? Two years. But I still haven't visited it. I didn't see the point. Why come to Paris and go to the one place where you're not allowed to smoke? As a matter of fact, it's my goal to be the only person who's come to Paris and has never set foot in the Louvre. You live how far from here? I'm probably about a 12-minute walk, 15-minute walk from the Louvre. But I'm close to Notre Dame, too, but I've never gone in there either. And it just doesn't interest me. I mean, I think so many people come here and they feel like they have to do certain things because somebody told them to do it or they're going to go home and people will say, what do you mean you didn't see the Pantheon? What do you mean you didn't go into the Louvre? So I'm guessing that a good number of these people are just standing here because somebody told them that they should do it. Well, I, I mean, you... I don't think that they're all museum goers at home. I don't know. Do people, like, look back and remember the experience of standing in front of a painting? I mean, I might remember eating something or buying something, or seeing something like an accident, or somebody who's really twisted up in some way, but not looking at a painting. Maybe I'm wrong. I mean, maybe this disqualifies for them that doesn't get any better than this, but I don't know. I just, from people that I know that have come here, they go to the Louvre because somebody told them that they have to. Today in our radio program, Where You Might Go in Paris Instead of the Louvre, I spent three days with David Sedaris, who writes a lot about what it's like to live in France. We never saw the Eiffel Tower or the Rodin Museum, or the famous cemetery where Marcel Proust and Jim Morrison are buried. No historical sites, nothing having to do with the culture or language of the people of France. But if you want to know the best place to buy a model of a rotten tooth, or a collection of leeches, or a life-size replica of a human head with the top cut off so you can see what's inside, David did show me that. This is a pretty good medical supply store. Like these body parts that they have here, they're handmade and hand-painted. They're not nearly as expensive as, as you would think that they would be. Like I got my sister Gretchen a stomach, or a backbone. I got her a backbone made out of paper mache for Christmas, and I think it probably cost about $60, which was that's a great price for a backbone. Today on our program, Americans in Paris and how our Paris sometimes has very little to do with the one familiar to the locals. From WBEZ Chicago, this is American Life. I'm Ira Glass. The French government says that three and a half million Americans visited Paris last year. The U.S. government says it was more like two and a half million. Either way, it is a lot more than the actual population of Paris, which is 2.1 million. Americans have dreamy and romantic ideas about Paris. More than other places, I think. In 1944, at the liberation of Paris from the Nazis, E.B. White wrote, Probably one of the dullest stretches of prose in any man's library is the article on Paris in the Encyclopedia Britannica. Yet when we heard the news of the liberation, being unable to think of anything else to do, we sat down and read it straight through from beginning to end. Paris, we began. Capital of France and of the Department of Seine, situated on the Ile de la Cité, the Ile Saint-Louis, 
and the Ile Louvier in the Seine, as well as on both banks of the Seine. The words seemed like the beginning of a great poem. A feeling of simple awe overtook us as we slowly turned the page and settled down to a study of the city's weather graph and the view of the Seine looking east from Notre Dame. The rainfall is rather evenly distributed, continued the encyclopedist. Evenly distributed, we thought to ourselves, like the tears of those who love Paris. But what is it actually like in Paris, really, without the rose-colored glasses, if you're American? Well, our This American Life team headed overseas to find out. And let's just pause for a moment. What exactly does that sound like, you wonder? Well, here's a recording. Would you like to take a guided tour of Paris? No, 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 we're not tourists. Do we look like those people who run around gaping all day? I guess we can't understand anyone coming to Paris to work. My suggestion is that we all go straight to our hotels and get some rest. I, for one, am exhausted. Well, echo one of our program today. Him talk pretty three days. David Sedaris gives me, and you, a walking tour of his favorite places in the city that he calls home. Act two, Sa Vie Americaine, in which we try to answer the question, what is it that some Americans see in Paris anyway? What is the draw? Act three, notes of a native daughter. Why it helps sometimes to pretend your French accent is worse than it really is. And why it's harder to cut into a movie line in Paris than in New York. And whether it is the same for African Americans these days in Paris, as it was in the heyday of James Baldwin and Sidney Bechet. Answers. Stay with us. Act one. Him talk pretty three days. Two years ago, at the age of 41, barely speaking French, David Sedaris moved to Paris. He had no special feelings about France, no particular interest in the French. It would be the same if it's Korea, he said to me. A sentence that, I think if the French ever heard that he said it, they would deport him. He moved for two reasons. One, his boyfriend Hugh had a rundown house in Normandy. And two, why not? And over the course of two years, he has written extensively about his experience. In stories for the radio, for magazines, and for his newest book, In his stories, David portrays life in Paris as a series of humiliations and near humiliations. And if you hang out with him for a few days, you realize he is not exaggerating much. This is my worst nightmare right here. We'd barely gone three blocks from his apartment on our walking tour of Paris when he stopped on the sidewalk. Okay, my lighter has run out of fluid, fluid, which would mean that I would have to ask somebody for a match. And so what I would say is, hello. Do you have some fire? But, and I so hate saying that, that I usually carry like four lighters on me, so I always have a backup. So you're just digging into your bag here? Extra cigarettes, I know I must. People are cruel to him when he speaks and where they aren't. This is a hardware store where the owner and the people who work there are really, really nice to me. I buy things here all the time. I buy things that I don't even need just because they're so kind, and they generally just start laughing right when I walk in the door. And then the owner will call his assistants out of the back room and say, he's back, he's back. And I buy things like, uh, I bought a heating element for so I could make tea in my hotel room because I had to go to Germany. So I could go in and say, hello, I am looking for a stick that make the water hot, hot today. So I say, like, really stupid things when I go in there, but I I only say it in French, but they're incredibly good sports. I bought an ironing board and I was able to say, hello, it has been three weeks I bought an iron. Now, today, I look for a table that might work with my iron. Have you such a table? And he said, ah, an ironing board, and went and got one out of the back, but he's really, really nice, and it's a place I can always count on where somebody's going to be good to me. Do we want to walk in the hardware store? Do we need anything? Um, Do they sell batteries? Yeah. Could you get me some AA batteries for the, for the camera? Sure. We need four. I'll pay. It's a tiny store, just enough room for a few customers to stand. A store that's taller than it is wide, with shelves full of merchandise running up to the ceiling, plus brooms, feather dusters, baskets, simply hanging over our heads to be retrieved by a hook on the end of a stick. Merci beaucoup. Bon voyage. Au revoir. 
Comment ça va, monsieur Ça va. Euh, ça fait longtemps, on vous a pas vu. Vous, vous étiez en vacances encore Oui, oui, je suis allé aux états unis Ah, c'est pour ça Oui. Monsieur. Ça, c'est mon ami. Il oui. fait une documentaire, oui, de oui. ma vie. Oui. Il a enregistré tout. This is my boyfriend, David says, trying to say, this is my friend. He is making a documentary of my life. He tapes everything. Aujourd'hui, je cherche des piles. Double A, s'il vous plaît. 58. We pay, there's small talk, and we're back on the street in less than a minute and a half. See, that's what's so nice about that guy, all right? I went in and he said, I haven't seen you for a long time. Have you been on vacation? And that's just worth the world to me. That is so incredibly nice for somebody to, to notice your absence. Some shopkeepers don't notice him. He'd been buying his newspaper from the same woman in his neighborhood seven days a week for over a year. And recently she said to him, out of the blue, are you a tourist here on vacation? And I said, I've been coming here and buying my newspaper every day for the last 19 months. No, I'm not on vacation. I have an apartment around the corner. But it took, it took that long for her even to acknowledge. Better if he transformed himself from the inept foreigner to the inept foreigner with a charge card. People will be really nice to you if you spend a lot of money. So then I just started going out and buying things. I could have a bad day in school. I'd go out after school and buy a desk or like pricey lamps because people were unfailingly nice while I was writing out that check. And I would say the most screwed up thing and they would say, oh, you speak so well. And they would compliment me, and I would just feel so good. And then I would leave, and I would think, wait a minute. And it took a while to get that under control. So I feel like, you, like just like observing your day as an outsider, I feel like you've put yourself into this position where the smallest human acts of kindness have turned out to mean so much. They have, whereas before there were things that I didn't really think about. It doesn't take much to make me happy now. Whereas before, I feel like it took quite a bit. The last time I was there, and so I go downstairs to have my breakfast, and there's six people seated at a table. And usually they've got lots of tables, but here there's only one table. And I'm thinking, well, I don't really want to sit with six people, but if I turn around and leave, then they'll think that I'm being rude. So I've gotten this far, so I have to sit down at the table with these six people. So I pull out a chair and the man says something to me in German and I say, oh no, just coffee for me, I'm fine with that. And what he was trying to tell me was that I was in his kitchen. This was the kitchen of the owner and this was the owner of the hotel in his, and his family sitting down to breakfast. <laughs> I just saw this door and I opened it and I was in their quarters. And then he had to go and wake up his nine-year-old. So his nine-year-old come and explain to me in English that in fact the dining room was downstairs. So I don't see that. And so I didn't see it as an adventure. It just happened. David moved here at a particular moment in his life. After years of making his living cleaning apartments or carrying furniture, he finally had published books, made the bestseller list, was on the radio, went on tours and filled 2,000 and 5,000 seat halls with people who wanted to hear him read. And... I think most people are built to take only so much of that, to have people think that we're somebody. I think for most people, for people who are not hopeless egomaniacs, there is a normal balancing that has to happen, of believing that they're a somebody to believing that they're a nobody. There's a ratio, a balance that has to happen in most people's heads. I've known David for 10 years, and I think that what happened to him is that the somebody side of that equation got crazily inflated, fantastically inflated. And so the nobody side had to hyperinflate to catch up. They had to balance out. If a nation of book-buying adults was going to tell him how great he was back home, he needed an entire second nation of adults, reminding him that really, how important was he? Yeah, that's exactly the case. And when I do go back, it's not like going from, I don't know, having an audience to being anonymous. It's beneath... I mean, it's, it's beneath the planet of the apes. It's going from having an audience to being, to being a foreigner, which is the lowest life form, is to be a foreigner. When you were a kid, were you feeling humiliated a lot? Yeah. I mean, I always had 
I didn't want to open my mouth because I lisped and I sounded like a girl. So it's not, it's a feeling that I'm used to. Really the feeling that I get here is more comfortable to me. One day David takes me to a cafe that he goes to all the time, often alone. And I'm surprised when he tells me that he is somebody who, until recently, had trouble going to a restaurant or a cafe by himself, just to get a cup of coffee. Because I'm always afraid that they're not going to see me there. And then they'll just be stuck there. And other people will say, look, they're, you know, no one's waited on that guy. And he's been there for half an hour. And he doesn't know what to do with himself. I get terribly self-conscious in those situations. I mean, do you? I'm not scared that if I'm sitting in a restaurant alone that, that they won't see me. Like, I assume that, that they'll see me and that they'll wait on me. You know what I mean? It's a business and they need the money and so they'll usually wait on you. No, but I'm always convinced that they don't see me and that they're not going to wait on me. And it just seemed to happen to me so many times in my life that I would go into a place and then you have to pretend like you're leaving of your own volition, like you've been waiting for somebody and, and then you look at your watch and... Like, don't, well, I guess they're not going to show. I'm not going to sit around here and wait any longer. And you make this whole, this whole little play that you do. But really nobody's watching it. But it's very elaborate. And then you can get out, get up and leave. The thing is, like, what you're describing is, like, you're sitting there and you think that other people are watching in such a way that they will think, oh, that guy hasn't gotten waited on. Because that's what I do. I look at people like that. And I notice when it happens to other people. And it's because I look at things like that that I imagine that everybody else is. This turns out to be quite a burden to carry into a foreign country. If somebody does something stupid in front of him, David says, he goes home, writes it down, tells his friends, sometimes turns it into a story that he reads in front of thousands or tens of thousands of strangers. And so, when he says something stupid in French, which he does daily, he believes that it is possible that the shopkeepers or waiters just shrug it off, never think about it again. But it seems just as possible that they go, tell their friends, and laugh at him. That's why I get so embarrassed of the way that I speak. It's because I go home and I write everything down. That's the way I am. I assume that everybody else is that way as well. We walk to the places that David likes best in Paris, and it's like hopping from one discreet island that David had already explored and found to be safe for human habitation to the next discreet island. I think this is the way that anybody gets to know any new city, especially a city where you do not speak the language. You try one place, and then you try a second place, and you return to those places over and over, slowly expanding your territory to gradually include more little spots that you return to. The places David takes me to usually had one of these characteristics. They were fantastically unusual and interesting things to buy. They were places of a type which simply do not exist in the United States. They were places where the French was usually very simple. Often this meant the presence of children. At the Luxembourg Gardens, there's an old puppet theater where we see Treasure of the Sultans. It's like watching an art form as sturdy and indestructible as the cockroach. The slapstick, the menacing characters sneaking up behind our heroes' backs so everybody yells in warning. There always comes a point where he hits somebody over the head with a stick, and, and the kids just eat it up. Like when he starts hitting people with a the stick, they go bananas. I've seen, like, probably, this is... Uh, fourth time I've seen the treasure of the sultans. I just like coming because it just makes me so happy to be around people who are so happy. After the princess is saved from the pirates and the friendly tiger is rescued from the savage jungle to come live in Paris, we head outside to the carousel, where six-year-olds are strapped onto wooden horses and handed little wooden sticks play a game that dates to 16th century Europe or possibly earlier, a jousting game, where they try to spear a dangling ring while speeding by on horseback. David also takes me to one of the tiny mom-and-pop theaters in his neighborhood. The whole culture of movies is different in Paris, with hundreds of theaters showing all sorts of movies, new and old. Nice little place you have here, Mr. Lidecker. It's lavish, but I call it home. David sees a movie every day in Paris. He also takes me to the flea market that's open every weekend on the outskirts of the city. It's a sprawling warren of booths selling old paintings, watches, 
and would amount to five centuries of coffee table decorations. We find a device in one store from the early days of telephones. It's just a paper cone, really, designed to be attached to a telephone inside a theater. So your family at home could supposedly listen in on the concert or play over the telephone. In defiance, I might add, of all the principles of proper microphone placement. But that wasn't the highlight of our flea market trip. Whereas most places here, you know, people have their booth. And like I was here the last shopping day before Christmas. Um, oh, my God. That's Judge Judy. That's Judge Judy with that white parka on. I love Judge Judy. And that was her right there. Leon. And again, I've never been inside of it, but I know that all kinds of famous French people are entombed here. Like, I don't know, I think Balzac's here, or people like that, like really super famous writers, but I've never set foot inside. But I like the frozen grocery store that's across the street from it. The store is part of a chain that's all over France. It's called Picard. Everything they sell is frozen. And they've got this method for freezing that I don't think we have in the United States. Like, they could freeze lettuce. And they've got everything in there, from meat to frozen soups and spices. But it's not like TV dinners. Like, you can buy a little packet of ostrich chops or of uh, horse meat or duck legs stuffed with prunes and sausage. And they're sold just in plastic bags. So it's not, they've taken the stigma out of frozen food. And every French person I've talked to swears by this store, especially people who have kids, because the food is really, really good. And if you open one of these in the United States, you would just be minting money. You wouldn't be able to count the money fast enough. I guarantee you, it, it would be such a huge success. Inside, it is exactly what you want when you're traveling in a foreign country. Every object is familiar, but packaged and presented in a way that is pleasingly new and exotic. So it's all comprehensible, but at the same time, palpably foreign. And the foods walk that disturbing but fascinating line that foreign foods can have between looking delicious and looking frightening. Snails packed in green stuff in their shells of many different sizes, coolers full of massive frozen crayfish that look like they're about to come back to life, pre-made shish kebabs, asabuco. We pick up a few things, and then down the hill, we stop at the regular supermarket for a quick run to the dairy case. Hugh screamed at me last night. He was so ashamed of the butter that we served during dinner. And he, he held this brand of butter right up to my face and told me I'm never, ever, ever allowed to buy it again. So I'm here to replace that butter. Wait, what kind of butter did you buy? It was this, but it's Grand Jury brand. A butter of Brittany. And I'm not allowed to buy that anymore. Why? Because you said he was really picky about things like that. He, he said, I saw Ira putting that uh, butter on bread, and he, and he had like four pieces of bread, and I'm so embarrassed. That butter was awful. And I said, well, I don't really think that Ira's going to go home and write in his little notebook, dinner at Hugh and David's, butter was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you're wrong, my friend. <laughs> Note to listeners, if you eat at Hugh and David's, Avoid the butter. At 31 Rue de Bac, we climb a wooden spiral staircase to a store that's been in operation since 1831, De Roll, which David calls the Noah's Ark of taxidermy. There's a kangaroo, there's a moose, there's two wild boars, about five different varieties of monkeys, a hyena pair of zebras, a polar bear, uh, and a beautiful oak case containing different reptiles, snakes and lizards. And there's an ostrich. I mean, that ostrich is, what, nine feet tall? It's really magnificent. We walk through room after room filled with pigs and lions, cats and dogs, the dogs are especially real-looking. Some of them, according to the woman who runs the place, are stuffed by their owners, who then never had the heart to pick them up. The price to buy an ostrich or a lion or a gorilla is nearly $10,000. To rent them for two days is 420 bucks American. Most of the business is rental. David buys a magpie, black and powerful and sleek-looking, 
and we head down to the street. So did you have things like this when you were a kid? My mother had an, a great aunt who's the only person in our family who really had any money. And she was married to a man who was a big game hunter. And I only, she would come to our house to visit when we were young, but I only went to her house once, and it was right before she died. And she had a trophy room. And there were all kinds of animals in there, extinct animals. There were snow leopards in there. There were white tigers in there. And you would walk into this perfect room, and there were thousands of eyes staring at you. And I just thought, this is what I want. And that's the thing that I loved. And that's the feeling you get when you go into day roll, that, that all of these creatures that are, that are stuffed and po poised to pounce, that they're all staring at you. It's the same feeling you get from being in front of an audience. It's the same feeling you get in front of an audience. Yeah, that people are looking at you. But that these are creatures that are looking at you. You know that feeling, that feeling that, that somebody's watching you. David, of course, thinks about that feeling a lot, especially here in France, where he wonders what Parisians think as they watch him speaking so badly. But it's not entirely so hard, that daily stage fright, worrying about how to say every little thing, anxious and straining to understand all the words around him. It's that thinking that makes me feel alive and it makes me notice everything around me. When I become complacent, like I was in the United States, you know, you just get used to things, so you don't think about them. You don't, you think, oh, I'll get a cab, I'll go to the airport, I'll have a patty melt. You don't think about it. Whereas now, with me, the anxiety starts early on, and I'm always afraid that someone's gonna throw me a curveball and ask me a question, like, what sign are you? Just ask me a question like that out of nowhere, and I'll appear foolish. So it, it keeps me on edge, but really that, that edginess has always made me feel alive. Someday, David says, he'll be more comfortable in French, his accent will improve, and that daily anxiety will be removed from his life. And by the, when it is removed from me, then I probably won't be interested in living here anymore. I'll probably leave. Because it'll be just like living back home. Plus, the more you learn, the more disappointed you wind up being. Um, it's easy to like somebody when you don't know what they're saying. It's interesting, I hadn't thought about that, that, that not understanding somebody makes them seem more interesting than they really are. I just assumed that everyone talked about books and movies all the time. That's all they talked about as far as I was concerned. And then I learned a little bit more and I realized that they're no different than people anywhere else. They talk about the same banal things that we all talk about everywhere. At one point, at the cafe David goes to all the time, we sit and watch a waiter that David likes to watch, though he barely dares to say a word to him. The waiter's in his mid-forties, with a kind, baggy face. Picture the actor who played the scarecrow in The Wizard of Oz, Ray Bolger. And this waiter's kind of a cut-up. He hangs out with the regulars, making them laugh at this and that. That's what makes him fun to watch. I wonder, though. I wonder where that guy lives, or how much money he makes, or he's married. I just want, you know, you don't wonder about everybody, but I've always wondered about that guy. You think he makes his bed? For now, things are good for David in Paris. He still feels curious about everything, about figuring out what it all means, and that makes everything so interesting all the time. The mystery has not ebbed from everyday life. Ray Bolger takes a sip of wine. I always like it too when people drink on the job. He's behind a bar, he's drinking wine, he's smoking a cigarette, and he's picking his nose. Those are like three, those are three good reasons to live in France, I think. David Sedaris, his book about Paris is called Me Talk Pretty One Day. His latest book is Happy Go Lucky. Coming up, a public radio host who does not speak French mangles more foreign words in a minute. From Chicago Public Radio, when our program continues. 
I'm Ira Glass. This is American Life, the radio program that dares to ask the question, Madame. If I can lay my cards on the table at this point in the program, I have never understood why anybody cares so much about France. I mean, it's fine, it's lovely, but there is just this thing that some Americans have for Paris. Though, as they are the first to admit, it can be kind of ridiculous. Well, when people ask me where I live, and I sometimes say Paris, and they say, well, I mean, you live in Paris, I mean, but, but that's my dream. Kristen Hohenado has lived in Paris for five years. You know, why do you live in Paris? And I said, well, you know, I, I just sort of wanted to. All the reasons that you give sound really embarrassing, cliche, and, and ridiculous at this point. I mean, Paris is a stale dream. And, uh, and it's kind of like falling in love with the most obviously cute boy in the class or, you know, like the star of this or like a movie star. It's like being a groupie. And, <clears throat> and then you try to convince the other sort of 25 women who he slept with the last week, well, you know, I really love him and I think he loves me too, you know. There are some people who come here and they sort of get off on that feeling of being, they think they're unusual because they put themselves in this position. And to me, that's, that's really kind of awful and embarrassing. They think they're really special. Yeah. They think it makes them special to live here, as if it's A, as if it's original, and B, um, part of the horrifying thing about moving here, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a sort of disappointing experience to realize that your, your dream is so banal. I mean, this is a dream I had my whole life, and it seems ridiculous to me now that it meant so much to me, it was so important. The thing about loving a city, Kristen says, is that a city doesn't really love you back. Whenever I asked Americans who love France what it was about France that just got to them so much, when did it begin for them, their feeling about France? They all talked about scraps of French culture that made it to them when they were very young. The Madeleine books, the Red Balloon, French films, Montessori French class in grade school. I think there is still a part of America where the idea of Paris, Paris, not the space program or the internet or moving to New York City, Paris, represents reaching a world outside oneself. Richard Klein first started coming here as a teenager from a small town in Pennsylvania and has essentially constructed an entire life around the feeling that he got in Paris. He went on to become a scholar and director of the Romance Studies Department at Cornell University, author of several books, Eat Fat and Cigarettes Are Sublime, which are deeply suffused with a sensibility that is partly just un-American, or anyway, semi-Parisian, a sensibility that is all about the small pleasures of everyday life. You know, um, the, the French have a much more, um, a much more uncomplicated and much less guilty relationship to their body. I mean, beginning with sort of eating. I mean, not only the way they eat, the kind of pleasure that they take in eating. I mean, the American notion that food is medicine, for example, is totally repulsive. To, to the French, and yet uh, increasingly, I mean, in America, I mean, that's all you hear. I mean, people eat only as a function of what they think is good for them. And I mean, nobody in France would eat strictly as a function of what's good for them. I'll tell you, I, I think really the heart of it was, for me, when I came here in sort of 1958 for the first time, was Les Halles. Les Halles was the central marketplace, right in the heart of Paris, sort of not far from where we are. And I remember, I used to go there, not every night, but frequently. And then at around 2 o'clock in the morning, you would kind of go out in the streets in uh, Les Halles, which was the central marketplace, and they used to bring all the food every night. Trucks would, would bring the produce and the food from all over France to the center of Paris, to the heart of Paris, and display it in stalls sort of all around the streets. Uh, butchers were there with their sort of blood splattered coats and people made gorgeous piles of artichokes and carrots and cabbages and you know in the, it was two o'clock in the morning and it was like life was just beginning at that hour and people were there sort of buying and selling and and, and then right next to Leal was La Rue Saint-Denis. La Rue Saint-Denis was the, the, the center of prostitution in Paris. And, and the, the, the people who worked there 
would, you know, work until four or five o'clock in the morning, and then they would visit the prostitutes who were sort of there, or all sort of night. But, but this world, you know, of, of I don't know, this incredible sort of life and food and sex and beauty in the middle of one of the most beautiful parts and oldest parts of Paris, where there used to be until like the 19th century, the, the biggest cemetery was sort of right there in Paris. If you walk around Paris with Richard, he's constantly pointing out spots that had special meaning to Louis XIV. Or there's a restaurant that happened to be one of the first restaurants ever built in France, just after they began the idea of restaurants. Or the shops where the notion of putting big, huge windows on the fronts of stores probably began, so people could window shop. Fact is, a lot of what is so pleasing about being in Paris is simple. It's a really interesting, pleasing place just to walk around. When Kristen Hohen Otto tried last year to live back in the States again, she found she missed living in Paris. She missed all that. It could be kind of hard to get ordinary things done in France. You're always kind of an outsider here, even after years in the country. But she just feels better here. You know, you walk down the street in Los Angeles and you feel law. I mean, that's a terrible example because it's Los Angeles, but you feel kind of dwarfed. And, and here I just think, yes, this is exactly it. This is how life should be. The, the pace, the, the scale, the way it looks. Act three, notes of a native daughter. Janet McDonald had already learned the language. She'd already learned the culture, had French friends in a French apartment. When something happened that made her realize how much she hadn't figured out. I was going to the movies with a friend of mine from Yale who is black also. And like there's a, there was a long line. And we were like, let's jump the line. These white people, they're going to be scared of us. We'll just go and jump the line. We'll get to the front of the line. So, of course, you know, you walked up, up to the front of the line like, yeah, you want to try me? I'm black. That usually works in New York. These people were ready to rip our hair out. And they were white. I couldn't believe it. They were like, in French, what are you doing? The line starts back there. You can't just walk to the front of the line. They were like, ready to kick our butts. I was shocked. I'm like, these are white people and they're not scared of us. <laughs> That's when I realized I wasn't in Kansas anymore. And I liked it. I mean, of course, it was kind of humiliating because, you know, we're supposed to be the intimidating, scary ones. And then, like, all these, like, French bitches in high heels are, like, threatening us. And they were in our faces. <laughs> and it made me realize that the whole... White people than American white people. Different how? I feel much more comfortable. I feel that I'm not a black object. Richard Wright, uh, after arriving here in the mid-1940s, said that he felt that all of his life he'd been carrying a corpse with him. And when he came to Paris, he felt it slip off his back. Did, 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 you, have a, did you have that kind of feeling? Yeah. I really have to say that I have felt that way ever since I got here. And a lot of my friends say, you know, why are you living there? In fact, a friend of mine I went to law school with, he said, what is it about speaking French that makes white people not racist? He was very skeptical. But it really, it goes beyond that. It's, it's not just that we feel free of the burden of race because we're still black. I still experience myself as black. It's just that that's not like the center of my identity. It's not the first thing people relate to when I meet them here. Janet first came to Paris in 1975 and moved here in 95. She's a lawyer in the French office of a big American company. She grew up in the public housing projects in Brooklyn, worked her way into Vassar College and on to graduate school and law school. And like a lot of people who make the jump from very poor, crime-ridden neighborhoods into the college-educated upper-middle class, she felt like she didn't really fit in anywhere. Not with family and friends in the projects who were shooting heroin, barely surviving. Not with the black students she met in college. I thought they were bourgeois, southern belles. I didn't want to be anything like them, and they didn't want to be like me either. They thought I was trash. I was project trash. I thought they were like, they put the B in bougie. And so I grappled a lot with that, the racial identity, like what will my posture be? I'm from the projects, but you know, people say I talk like a white girl, and you know, then the white girls are like, oh, you're so project. 
And then when I got here, none of it mattered because if I spoke three words of French that made sense, people liked me and they celebrated me. So I didn't have to worry about talking like a white girl or a project girl or anything. It was an incredible relief. The central conflict of her life suddenly vanished. In Paris, all the distinctions about what kind of black person she should be, they were all moot. In fact, the most distinguishing fact about Janet was not that she was black. It was that she was an American, which surprised her. I associated the word American with, you know, white guys with flags on their lawns who didn't particularly like me. And people would call me American. And I'd say, I'm not American, I'm black. And these were like black French people. And they're like, you are so American. And they, I remember these French West Indian friends of mine, this one in particular from Martinique was saying, you even walk like an American. I'm like, what do you mean? What does an American walk like? And she said, they kick their legs when they walk. They kick their legs forward. I don't know, I tell my friends, because I was in Brooklyn just um, a few weeks ago, and this woman who'd never been to Europe was saying, so what's it like in, in France? Are they like, what are the people like? Are they prejudiced? I said, no, they like us. It's like incredible, a country full of white people, and like they like us. But it's still, it's a difficult thing because they like us, but they don't like other people who look like us. And that's sort of the French paradox. Paris, of course, has its own housing projects in the suburbs that surround the city, now with generations of Africans who were born on French soil, who face job discrimination, housing discrimination. And they're not well-received. They're not welcomed, and they are French. And so in a way, for African Americans, we're in a very bizarre position. It's almost like being an honorary white in apartheid South Africa. And I noticed that, you know, as my French got better and better, (laughs) that sometimes I wasn't as well received as I would be if I played up my American accent. When French people, if I walk into a shop and people would think I was just, you know, basically what I say, just another just like one of their own, like from Martinique or Guadeloupe. It wouldn't be the same reception if I, like, came on with a very heavy American accent or even spoke English. Why, how would they treat you if they, if they thought you were an African black? A little bit of a chill in the air. Like, you know, yes, may I help you? Not so much, oh, vous êtes américain. Oh, I love New York. I love to speak English. So it's it's very bizarre. It's a, it's a hard thing to reconcile because... I mean, good feeling is good feeling. And when someone <laughs> receives you and makes you feel good, you it's a positive experience. When, when you're in a shop and you can feel that there's a chill in the air and they think of you as an African, will you actually play up your American accent? Well, what happened was I started um, experiencing that. And so... I actually adjusted my my speech so that, you know, at least I would get the benefit of, like, being, I mean, I'm here in this country. I want to get the benefit of being an African-American. So instead of, like, walking in, uh, oui, madame, je m'intéresse à acheter ça, I'd say, oui, uh, s'il vous plaît, est-ce que vous pouvez m'aider? <laughs> um, maybe, maybe I shouldn't do that, but... And it works. Yeah, and it works. A friend of Janet's has suggested to her that maybe Parisians prefer black people from America because only a certain class of black Americans usually comes to France, educated, cultured, interested in France. When Janet asked the writer Cornel West about this, at a speech he gave this summer in Paris, that was his argument. Basically, he suggested it was a class thing. And he said, well, you know, look at you. You're professional. You're articulate. Um, Maybe if you brought 15 of your cousins, (laughs) it would be a whole different thing. So basically, he was saying, if I brought all my, like, homegirls from the hood, like, who didn't go to Vassar and who weren't lawyers and who didn't speak French, you know, the reception might be a little chillier, even though they also are black. About France, the country where this transformation took place, it can be sort of shocking to actual French people. 
when we just won like Euro 2000, I was like, I came to work and I was telling the Moroccan secretary, we won, nous avons gagné. And she like, you know, just glares at me because she was born here and she says, I'm not French, I'm Moroccan. It's just like black Americans. I'm not American, I'm black. And I was like, we won, we won. And she's like, what are you talking about? You're not even French. What do you mean we won? I'm like, I'm French in my heart. <laughs> and this black friend of mine was saying, you know, you're the only person I know who could sing the Marseillaise. That shows like how extreme you are. You know why? It's because I say to them, I never had a country. I never had a country. I had like a hood. I had Brooklyn, but I never felt like I had a country. So now I have a country. It's a little one. You know, we always come in third or fourth place in the Olympics, but it's like France. Here's something else. There are certain things about French culture, Janet says, that just make life here very pleasant. For one thing, people don't ask you personal questions. Where you grew up, where you work, what's your family like, what's your story? You're not constantly explaining yourself. She says she has one friend who she knew for five years before she knew this woman had a grown son. Also, there isn't the same striving, the same ambition to be number one as in the States, especially compared with the corporate law jobs she used to have everybody was expected to put in 60 and 70 and 80 hours a week. Here, that would be seen as very strange. Work just is not that important to most people. Like, I'll get tears in my eyes, just like... Sometimes I look around the subway and I look at all these French people and I'm like, thank you for letting me live here in your country. We head outside. But you feel like it's your country, but, but your identity here isn't that of a French person, it's that of an outsider. I know, and I think that's what it is to be Project Girl. I was always an outsider, and I feel most inside right now, where I'm most outside. Go figure. <laughs> that's what freedom is, though. It's not about nothing left to lose. It's about nothing left to be. You don't have to be anything. I was, I was just thinking about it this morning. It's like, I'm an outsider. I will always be a foreigner, no matter how good my French gets. I will never really be French, no matter how much of a wannabe I am. And yet, I feel that I'm home. I'm just home. Around the corner from the cafe floor is where the author James Baldwin lived for a while. Jenna says she feels like she understands a little of how he must have felt, coming from Harlem, from a family that was always struggling, and then arriving here. Everything is so pretty and so much easier than home. Here we are. This is where James Baldwin lived with that painter, 56 Rue Jacob. But see, he lived way up in the top, on the top floor. Les Chaussée, one, two, three, four, fifth floor, obviously a walk up. And the cheapest apartments are... 